Okay, please, please take your seats. We'd like to go ahead and get started again. Thank you. Good morning. It's a uh, pleasure to welcome you back to the uh, second of our academic symposia to celebrate the inauguration of uh, Dr. Martin A. Schmidt as the 19th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, so as we examine the world around us and cast an eye to the future, uh, we are made keenly aware of the global challenges that we must confront. The urgent need to develop uh, new sources of clean and renewable energy, to establish a sustainable and resilient national and international infrastructure, to address human health and well-being, mitigate disease, to provide clean food and water to a growing population. These are all burning issues to which we must seek solutions. Uh, Rensselaer's history, we started off by distinguishing ourselves from the very beginning as a pioneer in civil engineering. Uh, and through that, we have continued to uh, transform ourselves and to help transform the world. The university has responded to the most challenging global challenges by devoting significant resources to biotechnology, to computational science and engineering to energy, the environment, and smart systems, and to nanotechnology and smart materials. We have supported interdisciplinary collaborations across academia, industry, and government, and deployed increasingly powerful computational tools and new approaches, including the intelligent use of data to seek answers to the really hard questions. Our next speaker, group of speakers, I should say, represent a cross-section of these fields in academia and industry, and they will share with us their views on the cutting edge of research in these areas and what the future portends. So to introduce them, uh, let me welcome Professor George Belford, Institute Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, to introduce the speakers. George. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes. So before I start, of course, I want to congratulate Marty um, it's a wonderful day today, and I wish him luck. Where is he? Way at the back there, waving. Uh, good luck, Marty, and thank you for accepting our offer and coming here to be our president. We're very excited. Um, I also would like to thank uh, the uh, Provost Hagella for uh, allowing me to introduce two wonderful people, a few wonderful people. Um, David Terrell is our next speaker, and um, he's the Ross McCullum uh, William Cochran Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, Carl and Shirley Larson uh, Provostial Chair, and Provost at uh, Caltech. Uh, David was educated at MIT, uh, he has an SB chemistry degree in 1974, and at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, he received a PhD in polymer science, this very famous department there on polymer science, and engineering, 1978. Um, he joined the Department of Chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University in 1978, returned to Amherst in 84, and served as Director of Materials Research at the University of Massachusetts before moving to Pasadena in 1998. Um, he told me uh, today that he's been to RPI three times. This is his fourth visit. And I uh, recall perhaps the first visit was for a evening seminar um, in which uh, I was organ organizing students to come in the evening after their classes. Uh, once every month we would have a seminar, and of course we had no money, so David was able to come here without being paid uh, for, uh, for a seminar. We had to put a little sign on the door that we were allowed to drink beer and have pizza, so I got that permission to do that. And I remember David came and uh, was very generous and uh, it, it was wonderful to see him and watch his career now grow from an un, uh, a, a young professor uh, at um, Amherst uh, to what he is today and you'll see the rest here. 
Um, as, at Caltech, he has served as chairman of the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, director of the Beckman Institute, and provost from 2017 to now. Uh, Terrell's uh, or David's research interests lie in macromolecular chemistry and in the use of non-canonical amino acids. Um, he's a, a, a very gentle fellow. He doesn't tell you that he discovered one of the methods to, to incorporate uh, non-natural amino acids uh, or residues into peptides. And um, it's opened a whole new world of capabilities of synthetic peptide systems using his method. But he didn't say that when I asked him for his background. Just wanted to tell you. His contributions to these fields have been recognized by his election to the American Academy of Arts and Science, the American Philosophical Society, and no less all three branches science, engineering, and medicine of the US National Academies. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce David to give us his talk. Oops. There we go. I'm gonna to try to step away from the podium the uh, microphone works thanks to our uh, support staff here for providing this uh, opportunity for me to wander around the stage a bit. Uh, thank you for coming back if you were here for the first session this morning. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, thank you to George for that uh, very generous introduction and to, to George and Prola Sajala for the invitation to participate this morning. I, and I would like to extend my congratulations to Marty Schmidt. I've known Marty essentially since he was appointed provost at MIT, largely through my service on MIT visiting committees and our interactions there showed him to be a, a wonderful uh, listener, a thoughtful uh, a member of the administration at MIT and I was absolutely delighted to see the announcement of his uh, appointment as president of RPI. Congratulations, Marty. So oh, my, my title is one of these very general titles that you give when you don't quite know what you're going to talk about, and, and that is true. I didn't know what I was going to talk about when I first gave the title. But I am going to tell you five or six short stories that intersect in the context of an ongoing global challenge. And I, went, since we're talking about biotechnology and health, you may not be surprised by what that global challenge is. You probably remember uh, November 10th, November 9th, uh, 2020, when Pfizer announced the success of its mRNA vaccine, that it was uh, shown to be 90% effective in preventing symptomatic uh, COVID-19 disease. That number was subsequently revised upward to about 95%. This was a new class of vaccines. Uh, based on messenger RNA, and as many of you know, messenger RNA occupies the central position in the flow of genetic information from DNA into protein through the processes of transcription and translation. We use those terms because transcription involves the conversion of one set of nucleotides into another set of nucleotides, maintaining the nucleotide language of the macromolecule. And then the translational step which goes from a language of nucleotides to a language of amino acids. We've been using proteins as therapeutics for more than a century. And a particular landmark was the introduction of insulin to treat diabetes a century ago, 1922. But RNA therapeutics were much more slow to develop. In 1990, John Wolfe and colleagues at Wisconsin showed that RNAs could be injected directly into mouse muscle and produce proteins in the muscle directly after injection. And their paper has this intriguing statement, essentially the last sentence of the paper. The intracellular expression of genes encoding antigens may provide alternative approaches to vaccine development. That was 1990. 30 years later, the idea worked beautifully. 
This is the plot that the New York Times gives us every day of new COVID cases uh, across the country. On November 10th, 2020, we had about 120 thousand new cases because the vaccines didn't become available until a little bit later. Those case numbers continued to rise until early January where we had more than a quarter of a million cases reported each day. And then as the vaccines were rolled out, we saw this dramatic decline to about 10,000 cases per day in late June of 2021. And I think all of us probably felt at that point, you know, maybe we're out of the woods, maybe we're back to normal. And uh, in fact, we can put this virus behind us. That turned out not to be true. <laughs> this is the way it went. Delta came along just a few weeks later, then Omicron, then BA5. When I made up this slide 10 days ago, we were at about 50,000 cases across the country each day. Thankfully, we're a little bit below that now, something like 45,000. So I'd like to tell this story uh, in the context of six questions. Uh, what was required to enable the development of this new class of vaccines? Why did it take 30 years? And then why did it come together so quickly for COVID-19 after we hadn't been able to do it for 30 years before that? Why were our initial hopes not met? Might they be in the future? And then most broadly, what does this teach us about the future of biotechnology? My starting point is going to be 1922. Not because that was the introduction of insulin, because that was the date of birth of Gobind Karana, one of my scientific heroes. He was born in a small village, a village of about 100 people in western British India, now part of Pakistan. There was no school in his town for young children, so he was educated out in the open in the town square for the first few years. He then attended uh, more conventional schools through high school, went on to bachelor's degree at Lahore, PhD in Liverpool, postdoctoral work in Zurich and Cambridge. And uh, continuing the theme that uh, George raised earlier about going somewhere without being paid, uh, <laughs> Professor Karana had to support himself for a full year in Zurich because there was no money to support him during that time. But he found the means to do that. By 1952, he had secured his first independent position at the University of British Columbia, where he initiated his studies on polynucleotides. This was a remarkable series of studies, and I show the headline from the first paper here, where he showed us how to make internucleotide linkages, and in particular, the synthesis of dinucleotides. So what did this paper show? It showed that you could take two nucleotides, both based on thymine, couple them together to get the dinucleotide through the sugar phosphate linkage. It took two days to do that, and the yield was 66%. So only two-thirds of the starting material showed up in the final product. A modest beginning, but with enormous consequences. Just 10 years later, it resulted in the award of the Nobel Prize to Professor Karana, shared with Robert Hawley and Marshall Nuremberg for their interpretation of the genetic code. What uh, Professor Karana was able to do was to make polynucleotides, feed them to ribosomes, and see which proteins are made, and then could determine which amino acids are encoded by which triplet codons. The progress in this field has been extraordinary. Uh, from taking two days to make one linkage, you can now order full-length genes from the biochemical supply houses. The cost is less than 10 cents per nucleotide. So if you need a gene that's 2,000 base pairs long, you can get it for a little over $100 in a few days. Orders and orders of magnitude of progress since the initial seminal uh, studies by Professor Karana. At about the same time, a key observation was made uh, in the UK, and that was the first observation of the human coronaviruses by June Almeida and David Terrell. I couldn't skip that one. <laughs> This is the first uh, photograph, an electron micrograph, of the human coronavirus 229E, which causes common cold. And it shows the spike protein that we've been hearing a lot about over the last two years, an obvious target for vaccines and therapeutics. This is June Almeida. She's also an interesting human story. 
Uh, she came from a family of modest means. She was interested in higher education, but they didn't have the resources to send her on to school beyond age 16. She had to stop her schooling at that point and take a series of jobs to support her family. It turned out she had remarkable facility uh, in the experimental laboratory, and in particular, she was a master of electron microscopy, and this image was recorded by June Almeida. About 10 years later, Fred Sanger and co-workers showed us not how to make DNA, but how to sequence it, how to determine the sequence of a new piece of DNA, a gene, for example. The key idea was that you separate the two strands of DNA, you then make a new strand using the unknown as a template, and if you can put in a marker that corresponds to each of the four nucleotides and tell where those markers appear, you can read out the sequence directly. This has been uh, an enormously important uh, development in the history of biotechnology. The particular marker that uh, Dr. Sanger and co-workers used were chain terminators that lack the hydroxyl group that's required to form the sugar phosphate backbone. So they're called dideoxynucleotides, and if you can tell which of the four is terminating the chain at a particular position, you know which base is there. The progress here has been roughly comparable to the progress in DNA synthesis, where we can now sequence the full human genome for less than $1,000. When that was done for the first time, uh, about 20 years ago, it uh, cost several hundred million dollars. And so we're looking at something like uh, eight orders of magnitude, uh, or I guess it's five orders of magnitude improvement in the uh, efficiency of these processes. So at this point, we could make and uh, sequence nucleic acids pretty much at will. But there was a problem, and there's still a problem, with RNA therapeutics, and that's the limited stability of RNAs. They disappear rapidly. And that's, of course, an advantage to the cell, because the cell has to be able to switch between one program of protein synthesis and another in response to changing needs of the cell. And so you don't want all of those messages hanging around, making all the proteins that you needed hours ago and don't need any more. So messenger RNAs tend to disappear rapidly from the cell. But that's a problem when you want to use them as RNA therapeutics. And one of the problems in building on the early wolf work was that after some messages are injected into tissue, they don't stay around very long and they don't make very much protein. A key advance here was made by Drew Weissman and Caitlin Carrico at the University of Pennsylvania, reported for the first time in 2005. And what they showed was that if you modified the messenger RNA, it would improve protein expression. Many RNAs in mammalian cells are modified. They don't just have the four basic nucleotides, but they have variations on those structures. One of those variations is the conversion of uridine in which the sugar and the base are linked together through this nitrogen atom to pseudouridine, where the ring is spun around a bit and the linkage occurs to a carbon atom. It was subsequently shown that if you put a methyl group on this nitrogen atom, you could get further improvements in performance. So here's an example from a 2008 paper by uh, Weissman, Carrico, and their co-workers, where they're looking at uh, the extent of protein expression after introducing RNAs to cells, and you can see that if you substitute all of the uridines with pseudouridine, you get essentially a tenfold increase in expression. So we can stabilize RNAs, we can improve their translation, and now we need to get them into cells. This is a problem that's been under investigation for many years for many different purposes, not only introducing RNAs, but DNAs as well for gene therapy. The solution is to encapsulate them into lipid nanoparticles with a positive charge. The structure of the positively charged lipid that's in the Pfizer vaccine is shown here, developed by Peter Cullis and his co-workers at British Columbia and also his company Acuitas. Kerry Beninato at uh, Moderna developed a remarkably similar lipid. The fundamental idea here is that the positive charge on nitrogen allows complexation with the negative charge on the messenger RNA. That forms the package. 
and then there's a degradable structure through these ester linkages that allows uh, metabolism of the lipid uh, after injection and clearance from the injection site. So, here we were, 2017, 2018, that's roughly the state of the art that I've just described to you as of that time, and then COVID-19. In December were the first reports of disease. By the end of December, the World Health Organization was informed of the new illness. Just a week later, the Chinese public health officials shared the genetic sequence of the virus. A week later. That shows the power of these technologies, not only the sequencing technology, but also the informatics and the databases and data sharing and so on that's required for that uh, information to be widely used. We could see that it was about 30,000 nucleotides in a single strand of RNA. Special interest focused on the spike protein. The spike sequence was prepared with all the uridines replaced by N-methyl pseudouridine. Each of those size, by the way, is a pseudouridine. So there's a lot of pseudouridine in this message. It translates very well. And this, I think, is really extraordinary. The sequence was uh, released on January 5th. By April 23rd, the first vaccines were delivered to patients in Germany. And then in December, the Pfizer vaccine was granted emergency use authorization in the US. So it worked well, but not as well as we had hoped. And so there's been much discussion over the last half year or so about whether we're going to be just chasing variants one after another. And that's a pretty discouraging prospect, in part because we're not very good at it. So we're chasing BA5 at the moment. And look where the BA5 booster was introduced. Not really on the upswing here, but maybe as BA5 is passing from the scene. So the notion that we have to continue to chase variants is not a very attractive one, and it raises a question that I think has been raised by many research groups around the world. Can we develop vaccines that will neutralize all SARS-like viruses, even those that have not arisen yet? There are several research groups that are making good progress uh, on this idea. I'm going to tell you about the work of my colleagues Pamela Bjorkman and Christopher Barnes. Christopher was a postdoc with Pamela. He's now moved on to his own independent position at uh, Stanford, a brilliant uh, scientist. So Pamela and Christopher are structural biologists, so they get a good look at the structures involved of the spike protein, the antibodies that bind to the spike, and so on. Because there are millions of sequences deposited now for uh, COVID-like viruses, we can tell which regions of the receptor binding domain, this is at the top of the spike, which regions are highly variable through mutation, those are the orange regions, and which are highly conserved, those are the purple regions. Pamela's conjecture is that because those regions are highly conserved, they will probably be conserved in new coronaviruses as well. And if we could direct vaccines that would direct the immune system to those regions of the receptor binding domain, we might in fact have a pan sarvicovirus uh, vaccine. So what's the strategy? It doesn't use messenger RNA. It uses a structured protein nanoparticle that can carry 60 copies of the receptor binding domain. And the interesting one is what they call a mosaic nanoparticle that carries receptor binding domains from eight different sarbicoviruses, shown here in schematic form. Now, because the B cell receptors that uh, will eventually trigger the production of antibodies are triggered most strongly when they bind bivalently, what you would like is to have a situation where they bind down in this shared region. This is the only way on the mosaic particle that they can bind in a bivalent fashion because uh, none of the neighbors are the same except they share these conserved regions. And so the question is, will these mosaic nanoparticles direct the immune system down into this region of the spike protein? As a control, they make a homotypic SARS-2 uh, virus with only the SARS-2 spike on it. What, I'm, uh, what I'd like to highlight here is that on the mosaic nanoparticle, there is no SARS-1. 
no SARS from 15 years ago. So as far as these uh, mice are concerned, this is a new virus that hasn't appeared before, and the vaccine was not designed to address that virus. So how does it work? In mice, it works extremely well. So we're looking at two challenges here. A challenge with SARS-2, where we would expect either of the two vaccine designs to work, and we're looking at mouse survival as a function of time after they've been challenged with the virus. These mice are highly susceptible to the virus, so they almost all die unless they're protected in some way. So with a challenge uh, from SARS-2, uh, all three of these vaccines work. They're two different mosaic designs. But when we look at a challenge with SARS-1, the analog of the yet-to-be-seen virus, we see something quite different. The homotypic particle doesn't protect very well, but both, both of the mosaics uh, protect all of the mice from the disease. So we all know the, the catchphrase that uh, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Uh, so uh, it remains to be seen whether this will be helpful in human patients or not. Pamela is uh, in the process of setting up a human clinical trial which is expected to begin in 2024. They have to establish manufacturing and uh, permitting processes in order to get there, but we should know by some time in 2024 whether this idea works in human patients. So I want to come back to the six questions that I posed at the beginning, and I'm going to finish here. Uh, what was required to enable the development of mRNA vaccines? We talked about some of the specific examples, but the point that I'd like to make is that this is based on an enormous foundation of work in fundamental biology and chemistry, most of which had absolutely nothing to do with vaccine development. Why did it take 30 years? That's a long list of stuff and took a long time. Why did the technology come together so quickly for COVID-19? I think there are three reasons why it did. The first is it was a terrifying public health crisis. Uh, that was driving everyone to do what they could. There was a substantial profit motive. It's projected that this year's sales of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will be $50 billion. There's no doubt that that motivated Pfizer, Moderna, and BioNTech and other companies. But again, I'd like to come back to the fact that this was built on decades of investment in research. Without that investment and that edifice, uh, this would not have been possible. Why were our initial hopes not met? A uh, combination of viral evolution, transient immunity, and also public policy and, and uh, the choices that people have made with respect to uh, use of the vaccine. Is there reason to believe that our initial hopes might be met? I think there is for reasons that I described in Pamela's vaccine and other approaches that are on parallel tracks. And finally, what does this story teach us about the future of biotechnology? We come back to the foundation of experimental and computational tools, fundamental research, and extraordinary human dedication and imagination. And I uh, note the wonderful facilities and outstanding faculty that you have here on this campus and areas that are relevant to these kinds of developments. And I'm certain that RPI will play an important role in these developments in the future. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Um, well, doesn't matter. Um, so I'm struck by the fact that uh, on the wild type spike or any of the other ones that are being developed from, from a, you know, the mRNA going into the, the body and then eliciting immune response, that there's not some antibodies being developed against those common regions. And, and is it because that they're poor epitopes for some reason? Is it because they... Uh, somehow they are doing what they're doing, but not everyone is able to develop the antibodies against them, and that could give rise to a population that is protected, even by just getting the wild type, but not protected against, uh, uh, but a large population just won't have that protection against the more uh, developing variants. Yeah. 
I don't know. A very good question, and I, I don't think the answers are, are known, but I'll give you an answer anyway. Uh, you know, the, the uh, top of the spike is, is the most exposed, uh, and so it appears that antibodies uh, uh, are raised primarily against those regions. But one reason why Pamela and Christopher and their colleagues thought this approach was possible is that they've looked at the antibody binding complexes directly. And so they know that there are antibodies that bind down in the uh, highly conserved region. And what they're trying to do now is to direct that uh, response specifically to, to that region uh, through the structured nanoparticle approach. So the, those antibodies are there. Thank you. I wonder if you could speak about the human behavior element in, in health, the social dimension, right? The pills that I take every morning, this brilliant scientists have spent decades of research to <laughs> you know, bring that little pill to bear. If I forget to take it, all of that work was in vain. Yeah. You know, the COVID-19 crisis has really um, you know, brought that to the forefront as well. How do, we, um, you know, how do we approach dealing with that dimension in the future? Yeah, well, I certainly agree with the premise of your question. Uh, that much of what we saw uh, in the unmet expectations uh, from the initial vaccine results comes from uh, either limitations of making the vaccine widely available, which uh, you know, we've continued to try to, to do, and, and it has been penetrating into uh, many other places after, uh, after development here. And in fact, the U.S. is nowhere near leading the world in, in uh, vaccine uh, uptake by the, by the population. And so there are both uh, limitation, fundamental limitations of getting the technology out to a global uh, population when we have these genuinely global uh, threats. And then there are the, the more uh, discretionary decisions that, that people make uh, where they uh, may not want to uh, use a technology that's not only protective of themselves, but protective of the population as a whole. And, uh, you know, because we live in educational institutions, we continue to hope that the, uh, the best approach is, you know, uh, more effective education of people to see what the, the uh, consequences of their decisions are. But... Uh, it's a very difficult part of the problem. <laughs> so Matt, that was a wonderful talk and a spectacular demonstration of the value of basic research. Melissa Moore was here just a couple of weeks ago and yes, Melissa underscored the very same. Um, that the reason it took 41 days between when they received the sequence and they sent their first um, RNAs to NIH for clinical trials was all because it was based on decades of fundamental research. And my question is, we are making terrific progress scientifically and biotechnologically but getting the word out to the person on the street is where we fail. And I'm wondering what your suggestions are on how to remediate that in the future. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I had a suggestion that I thought had some chance uh, of broad success. But I, uh, you know, I, I do believe that continued education and demonstration of the effectiveness of these technologies will have an impact gradually. You know, we, we do have successes where diseases have been for, uh, for practical purposes eliminated. And so there, there have been examples where we've been able to push these technologies far enough into the population that it has the kinds of outcomes we, we're looking for. Uh, the, the current environment seems to be a difficult one in which to execute on that, but uh, it is possible. Okay, yes. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Thank David, you. for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Oh, well, Professor Belfort and I are taking turns to introduce speaker, and it's really my pleasure to introduce a friend of Rensselaer, Dr. Mukesh Kare, who is a vice president um, of hybrid cloud at IBM Research. Mukesh drives IBM's hybrid cloud research agenda, which spans um, semiconductor, uh, semiconductor systems and cloud technologies. Uh, he leads a global team of more than 1,000 researchers who are redefining the future of computing. Um, his interests include um, materials and devices for semiconductors, um, novel architectures, uh, and design cloud and enterprise systems and software um, for hybrid cloud. At IBM, um, Mukesh's team has made major breakthroughs, uh, such as development of seven nanometer um, chip technology and more recently two nanometer chip technologies. In 2019, he championed the formation of the AI Hardware Center uh, to drive innovations in AI hardware technologies through public-private uh, partnerships. Um, he's received a number of awards, including IBM's Corporate Award for Technical Accomplishments, and he's also an IBM Distinguished Engineer. And I think just earlier this week, um, he was appointed by the U.S. Department of Commerce as a member of the Industrial Advisory Committee that will provide guidance to the Secretary of Commerce on a range of issues related to domestic semiconductor research and development in support of a Chips for America Act. Uh, Mukesh received his MTech from IIT Bombay and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Yale University. We're going to hear about what's next in computing, intersections of bits, neurons, and qubits. Mukesh, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shekhar, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, it's truly, truly an honor to be here today. To, to celebrate uh, inauguration of uh, President uh, Schmidt. Congratulations, uh, President Schmidt, on behalf of uh, IBM. And uh, I'm here to essentially talk about uh, the partnership that IBM and uh, RPI had over many, many decades, and how together uh, we have, uh, we have uh, innovated and created the uh, IT industry that we are all enjoying, as well as talk about our future there's so much ahead of us uh, in, this, uh, in this industry. Today is also a very special day uh, that uh, actually President Biden is visiting IBM right here in Hudson Valley to essentially celebrate uh, what we have done together, to celebrate uh, many of the accomplishments of uh, you know, chip technology as well as compute technology that, uh, that IBM and RPI have worked uh, for, for decades. I'll talk about another story beyond biotechnology, a story around computing. And I'll share a vision that how, uh, how many different fields of computing are coming together and creating so much excitement and such a bright future for our industry. Uh, before I start, I wanted to give a little bit of a background about uh, IBM research. Now, I, I heard in the more earlier today from uh, Provost uh, Hajela that uh, RPI is uh, more than 200 years uh, old, and uh, IBM is a little more than 100 years old uh, company. And uh, we are proud to say that we are the only company in the world uh, in IT industry which has survived uh, 100 years. And uh, that uh, we are very proud of that. And, uh, uh, and the one reason that IBM has survived and continue to do well in IT industry is because of IBM research. IBM research is the crown jewel, and the mission for IBM research is to keep reinventing, keep in, you know, coming up with new ideas so that IBM can continue to transform. When IBM started, we used to make uh, typewriters or even cheese cutters, and here we are building quantum computers. Uh, IBM uh, research is a worldwide. It's a, it's a global organization. We have more than 3,000 researchers, mainly PhDs uh, or masters, uh, uh, in 16 locations uh, all over the world, uh, or five continents. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, IBM Research uh, is also a very uh, academic uh, organization uh, with uh, many uh, awards uh, along, the, along the way uh, that IBM researchers have won in the field of science and technology. 
So today, you know, this is the, this is the mission, this is what we do. I'll talk about uh, what's next in computing and how we are continuing to work together, working with RPI and other major institutions to figure out uh, and continue to, to innovate in the space of uh, IT, information technology. So uh, let's start from the first question, you know. Uh, let's start from uh, IT industry and uh, ask the question, what is information? And if you look at what is information, uh, in 1940s, uh, you know, Klaus Shannon came up with the idea that uh, information is the resolution of uncertainty. And that's a very, very, very important idea. What he did was he abstracted out bits or the idea of information from the physical world. In other words, a physical world could be a vacuum tube, a physical world could be a transistor. And what he did, he converted that into a mathematical concept of bits, that is a uh, transistor is on, could be one, and transistor off could be zero, it could be vacuum tube, it could be bipolar, it could be anything. And essentially he, he used mathematical aspect of uh, physical, uh, uh, abstracted out the mathematical aspect from physical aspect and gave us the idea of bits. And since then, you know, we leveraged, we as an industry have leveraged that idea dramatically and semiconductor came about. Semiconductor was the technology that was able to you know, really uh, harness this idea and develop this entire industry around the digits or the bits, the idea of bits. And you know, I, I don't have to talk about it all the way from uh, space exploration to building uh, supercomputers. In fact, uh, this supercomputer that I'm showing here is also present right here at RPI. And we are very proud to partner with RPI to work with them, with RPI, leveraging this supercomputer's capability to develop technology for the future. As well as in the space of artificial intelligence, where again the idea of bits or the digital computing really you know, gave us so much power to, to continue to advance, whether in the space of biotechnology or, uh, or other areas. To, to share, to start with the idea of bits, uh, in fact, uh, I remember when I started uh, studying uh, microelectronics, the very first book I ever read was a book by Professor S.K. Gandhi uh, from uh, Rensselaer. Actually, he was one of the first, uh, prof first books that you know, anyone would read in uh, late 80s and early 90s about process technology. So clearly, you know, RPI has been right there in the forefront of semiconductor technology. And IBM, along the way, have been working on making exponential progress in you know, coming up with breakthrough innovations in the journey. On the y-axis is the number of transistors, and on the x-axis, some of the major innovation. I personally started my career at IBM almost at the beginning of when copper was already introduced. So I, I started working at IBM towards end of 90s. Uh, when copper was already announced, introduction of copper in the back end of the line for interconnect was already announced by IBM. And I started to work uh, on technologies and I was very fortunate to be part of this, uh, essentially an exponential growth as you can see on the left side, the number of transistors you can have on, uh, on a chip just kept growing and growing and today we are able to build a machine like this. This is IBM's uh, uh, Z machine, and I'll talk a little bit about it. IBM mainframe machines, which have more than, you know, in this case, uh, about nine to 10 billion transistors, and uh, it can perform one trillion web transactions per day. And, uh, you know, it also performs about seven trillion dollar worth of annual credit card transaction. In other words, if you have used your credit card today or have accessed a bank, you have gone through this machine. You're, your transaction went through this machine, and that's, this is the machine that is actually built right here in Hudson Valley between, uh, you know, in New York, all the way from Poughkeepsie to Albany, where we, where we do most of the research and manufacturing of this technology. So I will talk about a little bit more right across the river at Albany Nanotech, where we have this, I will say, world's uh, most advanced R&D facility for semiconductor research. It's a private, public, private, and uh, academic partnership. Rensselaer is deep part of uh, this partnership as well. And some of the 
tooling that we have or the infrastructure that we have here are producing truly, and I'll share some of the results with you, most advanced technology you know, within a 30 minute driving distance from Rensselaer. And we are very proud to be in this neighborhood and we are very proud to be partnering with RPI in many of our endeavor in this journey. The chip that you see here is a two nanometer chip. And this chip, uh, when, get, when it gets into manufacturing, will be able to hold as many as uh, hundreds of billions of transistors and all of them have to work. So you can't have like 100 billion transistors and some of them don't work, that is not acceptable. And I'll share with you why that is so important as we are developing this technology. And why this has been made possible? It has been made possible because of the partnership ecosystem. It's not just IBM, it's all of us together right here in, uh, you know, at Albany Nanotech in partnership with the state of New York. As you can see, pretty much the entire uh, ecosystem of industries, equipment companies, material companies, design companies, as well as chip manufacturers, some of them are not even listed here because they don't want to be listed because of the confidentiality reason. They are all here together, right here in the neighborhood, and we are creating this uh, fantastic technology in the space of, uh, you know, let's call it the bits or the traditional semiconductor technology. And uh, just last year, we were very proud in partnership with many of, uh, many of the companies that I talked about, as well as many of the universities. We created world's first two nanometer chip technology. And this chip, chip technology essentially you know, can provide 45% uh, better performance or 75% uh, better energy efficiency or power reduction as compared to what we've got today. And I'll talk about why all of these things are very important. Just to give you a perspective on dimension, the transistor structure that we are showing here on the left side was also invented here uh, right in Hudson Valley and uh, uh, actually working again with uh, many of these partners. And each of the, uh, the sheets that you see here in this transistor structure, their thickness is about five nanometer, which is about a couple of uh, strands of uh, you know, DNA that we just talked about. So clearly, uh, the progress in this field has been amazing. And this has been made possible again by, you know, yes, uh, Moore's law, but uh, uh, a tremendous amount of innovation in the space of material science, uh, uh, electrical engineering, and many, many more disciplines that, that are present here uh, and also working at IBM, uh, you know, from RPI. So that's the idea around bits, uh, bits which is the idea that, uh, you know, uh, as I talked about, has been there, and we have been enjoying exponential success coming out of the semiconductor industry that has enabled growth in that. Now let's talk about the next breakthrough or next major idea that is really, really changing the world. That's the idea around the artificial intelligence or as a, as a fun, we call it neuron, just to make it look, you know, make it look a little bit uh, you know, clear about bits. I talked about bits and I'll talk about neuron. Uh, now artificial intelligence, we touched a little bit about that uh, here in the prior conversations as well. This has really, really transformed uh, the way we work, the amount of capability uh, or the type of capability that we, we human can have and can really influence all the way from discovery of, uh, uh, you know, uh, medicines uh, in the uh, healthcare and life sciences space. In fact, most recently, the use of transformer models or a foundation model, that's what they are called. These are large, large parameter model with models which are built using hundreds of billions of parameters that are available uh, you know, using uh, open source or data that's available on the web. And these models are so powerful that essentially you can, and they are also available in the open, that you can actually write a question and the, these models can uh, answer that in the form of a paragraph or they can even write a blog for you on the topic that you're looking at right now. In fact, two weeks back, uh, uh, there was an announcement that uh, you can write a question and the models can actually generate a movie for you. It will not be a big movie, but a movie of, let's say, 30 seconds uh, that you can act just from the, I want to see this, and you can write that in the question, and the models are capable of now in a, in a having enough information to be able to generate uh, 
you know, short movie for you. These models are extremely valuable in the space of uh, cybersecurity or uh, in the space of uh, healthcare of life, life sciences, automation, uh, discovery of uh, new drugs. So clearly, artificial intelligence is changing the way, uh, you know, the way world is going to be uh, or the way we can exploit technology in future. So looking at that, yes, artificial intelligence is a great technology. However, look at the challenge that it's posing in front of us. So the most recent uh, AI model, uh, just uh, I talked about the transformer models or uh, uh, the GPT-3 on the top right side. The GPT-3 model that was introduced uh, uh, you know, a couple of years back, it uses 175 billion parameters. However, the amount of energy needed, amount of compute power needed for that one model to be trained is almost equivalent to you know, three jetliners taking trip between San Francisco and New York. That is not a sustainable model. Yes, we can build these models, but can we continue to build these models? And this is just the beginning. If you look at uh, the, the rate at which these models are growing, Moore's law, which I talked about just before with enormous progress in Moore's law, two times improvement every two years. What we're talking about with these transform models, transformer models are asking for 750 times improvement in compute efficiency every two years. That is, I will say this is a great challenge, but this is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity in front of us to be able to then, you know, harness all the power, power of all the, all the research and the students and the, the partnership ecosystem I talked about, to be able to develop technology to be able to address these type of challenges and then to, for the betterment of uh, society. So, you know, here uh, uh, now, you know, so the, the requirement that we are going after is that, okay, you want to go way beyond, way beyond Moore's law. And what can you do way beyond Moore's law to be able to address these type of models? Now, the, I, I'm, you know, the newer model that are coming up are going to use a trillion parameters, which is amazing. You know, it's mind boggling that uh, how do you go build those models and then deploy those models and use those models. So clearly on one hand, application and, uh, and the need for compute is increasing. On the other hand, I will say it is also increasing opportunity for us to be able to develop technology, to be able to build these kind of models. So I'll come back again. Uh, the way we think about it is always in the form of partnership. We always believe at IBM that uh, it's not us, it's all of us together all of us together working with uh, many companies I talked about, uh, academia, uh, and in, uh, as well as uh, government, to be able to develop these type of technologies. So in the journey, we, 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 have, we realized uh, you know, many years ago that yes, artificial intelligence, AI technology is really going to take off, and it's going to need a different mindset uh, from where we are today to where we have to go. And for that, uh, uh, in 2019, we launched an initiative called uh, AI Hardware Research Center, uh, which is a public-private partnership. Uh, we have many members who are part of that, uh, that partnership, including uh, Rensselaer, who is a very deep partner with us uh, in that, uh, looking at developing technology so that we can start to address some of the challenges that the AI models are asking us to, us to work on as well as uh, the partnership we had launched again uh, with RPI, the AIRC initiative, which is looking at uh, algorithm aspect uh, of uh, AI technology, software aspect, as well as some hardware aspect. So together between AI Hardware Center and AIRC initiative, uh, we are very proud to be partnering with our Rensselaer to develop technology, which is now going to help us beyond the bit story that I talked about, the, the story of addressing and needs of uh, uh, the AI model training. Uh, just to give you an example, this is the test bed that uh, on the left side, that's the supercomputer I talked about. Uh, that is part of our partnership with Rensselaer, which is right here at Rensselaer. And uh, uh, IBM is using it, IBM's partners are using it, and RPI is using so that we can co, uh, you know, use these uh, powerful supercomputers to build technology for the future. So we want to thank RPI for their partnership and being able to host it and provide us uh, actually access to this computer to, to develop next AI technology. At AI Hardware Research Center, our goal is to improve uh, compute efficiency or uh, power, power reduction by 1,000 times by end of this decade. 
And I'll share with you, we are well on our journey to be able to achieve that goal. Now, a couple of ideas. This is a roadmap for, for AI technology that we are working on, uh, which essentially you know, starts with the digital, uh, which is what we've got, the bits world. Uh, how can we improve, uh, uh, how can we learn from uh, you know, uh, ourselves? Because it's artificial intelligence technology, meaning we are learning from you know, how our brain works. So do we need to perform computation at very high precision, like 32-bit uh, computation or 16-bit computation when we are trying to compute uh, for recognizing a picture? Now, just as an example, reduced precision computing, the picture on the top left is a very low precision picture. However, every one of us can recognize that picture. The reason, because we, the, the goal is to recognize picture with less number of bits. You do not need very high fidelity picture to recognize Mona Lisa. What it does is that if you start to reduce the number of bits for computing, you can quadratically reduce the power used for computing. And that's the power of going towards reduced precision or reduced bit computing. And we've been working on it, uh, you know, developing both developing chip architecture as well as algorithm, because we want to be able to recognize or be able to perform AI, work, AI computation Without, lose, without losing accuracy. We want to make sure the result is accurate. However, we do not want very high precision computation so we can reduce power. So we started with that as our step one, uh, which is the reduced precision computing. And then to later on, we are going towards analog computing. Now think about it, right? The, the world of computing started with analog computing, but the analog computing was uh, kept behind because it was never, uh, you could never get very high you know, precision when you're doing analog computing. However, if you think about, uh, you're replicating brain, you're trying to figure out how brain works, and brain is not digital, brain is analog. If brain is analog, and the way we think, if we can start to develop materials and develop uh, architecture, which can learn from, uh, you know, instead of storing all the information in the form of di uh, digits, can we start to store information in the form of uh, uh, you know, voltage and current, and use very simple principles like Ohm's law for multiplication instead of going through thousands of cycles. I mean, multiplication is a very complex process when it comes to digital computation. Uh, so uh, we are developing these materials, again, partnering uh, with uh, RPI in creating these uh, new, new analog compute elements so that we can start to perform those uh, critical multiplication function. Essentially, most of the neural network functions are uh, multiplication and accumulation. Uh, that's, uh, and you can use uh, you know, many of the ideas around analog computing to go develop. And then you can get 100 times or 1,000 times improvement in, in the compute efficiency as compared to where we are with the digital technology. And coming it, pulling it all together, this is the, we have uh, obviously with IBM being a business, we, I, we have employed that into our own uh, systems. Uh, this is the, this, uh, uh, IBM Z16 system, which has the chip uh, microprocessor, which is called Telem microprocessor, which uses the reduced precision computing that I described earlier on, where for certain workload, now one application that was very important to us was uh, during transaction fraud detection. What it is is that when you swipe your credit card and it goes, the, the transaction goes to this computer for approval, uh, we don't know, how do you determine if it's a fraud or is it a legit transaction? we can actually run an AI model on that transaction and get results within a few milliseconds because at point of sale, you want a result within a few milliseconds. On the back end, on the computer, you want to run a very complex AI model. So we are able to deploy this uh, in-transaction uh, AI compute capability by putting this reduced precision compute on the chip itself. And that has given us significant as much as uh, 10x uh, improvement in uh, performance and that is employed into the system that is already shipped out. This is the IBM Z16 system that was uh, announced uh, earlier this year, which employs many of the technologies I talked about from the bits area, uh, working on seven nanometer and two nanometer technology to the neurons area, which is working on reduced precision computing. And as you can see, you know, this is a combination of bits plus neuron, and this is how the computing is coming together between, uh, between digital world as, and the AI world this is world's most, uh, I can say, most reliable uh, and uh, you know, scalable and secure computing system. 
And this is what we are, uh, you know, celebrating here together on the creation of these technologies. And, uh, you know, our president is celebrating at IBM site today to be able to manufacture this technology right here in Hudson Valley and create uh, more opportunities uh, uh, economically for, uh, for the region. So those were the two, uh, two part of the story, the story around Bates and story around Neuron. Now there's another area of computing that is really taking off. There are, uh, so before I start, I will say from a complexity theory point of view, because of the way we perform computing, there are two class of problem. A class of problem which we call easy problem, or the problems where number of variables are limited, However, there is a class of problem where the number of variables are just growing exponentially. And especially in the space of uh, uh, you know, fundamentals or space of uh, chemistry, or in case of I've learned from Shaker around uh, protein folding, uh, many areas where the number of variables are just so many that you will, if you use digital computation, you'll need more number of, uh, you know, at, you know, you'll need more, we say more atoms in the universe to perform that computation. So those type of computation cannot be performed uh, uh, using traditional computing. And that's where the quantum computing comes in. Quantum computing, because it uses the laws of physics, and as I started, uh, the, the Shannon theory was to abstract out physics and make it mathematics. Whereas, why can't we go back and use the power of physics itself to perform computation? And that is a very, very powerful technology, the technology around quantum computing. And we believe that with the use of quantum computing, problems that can never be solved on any computer in the world could be solved. These are the kind of problems, the problems in the area of chemistry, material science, uh, factoring, where the number of variables are growing exponentially. And you cannot just uh, abstract it out and use bigger and bigger computers to solve those problems. That's where quantum computing come in. Now, quantum computing, just I want to give a very quick uh, uh, you know, introduction. Why quantum computing is so different? Because it uses three principles or three superpowers that it has, which I will say digital computing does not have. One is the principle of superposition, that you can have one and zero at the same time. Uh, the principle of entanglement, because one state can have an impact on other state, even if they're not physically connected. And the third is interference, where one state can cancel out another state. And these are the three superpowers that only quantum computing has, which digital computing does not have and will never have. So the way quantum computing works, so just as a very simple explanation, is that you start, uh, if you have an n-bit quantum computer, you create an equal superposition of two to the power n states. And for a 100-bit uh, quantum computer, two to the power 100 is actually more than the number of atoms on Earth. And you can create those many states uh, on, in a quantum computer to get started. And then what you do, you, you encode your problem, or you, pro you feed your data in the form of, uh, uh, you know, in the form of uh, rotation and the amplitude for each of the states and entangle them. And then what you do is perform interference. So now you've got a two to the power n state which are coded with the data. They are entangled. And the art of uh, algorithm is that uh, you essentially create interference such that the best answer gets maximized and all the other answers during this interference process gets minimized. And that's how you get the probability. The answer is in the form of a probability that this is the best answer. But the space that you're using for computing now is so big uh, that otherwise would not be possible in the traditional computing. So now you can see that this is very different. This is not how we have thought about computing. And we are very fortunate to be living in an era where truly, you know, after decades of computing, the, 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 the direction of computing has really diverged. The computing, which is the traditional computing or classical computing, will continue, and we will continue to innovate. However, quantum computing is taking off in parallel, leveraging the principles of quantum mechanics itself. There are areas where these, again, quantum computing cannot solve all the problems. These, the quantum computing will be in addition to classical computing. So we have to combine the two to get the best answers in the space of physics, chemistry, uh, machine learning in certain areas, it will not perform as good, and that we understand that as well. So it's a, it's a class of problem where it will solve uh, the best. 
This is a, this is a 100 qubit uh, quantum processor that we have also built right here uh, between Yorktown, Albany, and Poughkeepsie area, where essentially we are leveraging the power of semiconductor technology using, you know, perform, putting the uh, transmon qubits at one plane and using uh, super superconducting through silicon vias to connect those qubits to be able to you know, build these processors using a, uh, you know, packaging or 3D integration technology. Uh, now, the quantum computer itself looks very different. You have never seen a computer which looks like essentially a chandelier. Uh, <laughs> And the whole idea of this quantum computer is the chip is at the bottom, and what you're doing is you're pulling it down. You're pulling it down to 15 milli Kelvin. And I'm sure if some of you know what does 15 milli Kelvin mean, you know, it's cooler than the outer space temperature anywhere, uh, you know, out uh, in the universe. So clearly, it's a, it's, a, it's a very expensive and very big refrigerator to be able to cool this chip so that you can get enough coherence so you can perform those quantum computation and get the answer that you're looking for. Uh, this is a quantum one system that we, we have built. We have also built a very large community of, uh, of users all over the world who are accessing quantum computer using cloud technology. And that's where everything will come together. There has been, uh, you know, as you can see, billions and billions, almost two trillion of uh, quantum uh, computation has been run on hardware on these quantum computers where researchers and from very many, many areas are really learning how to use quantum computer and make uh, better and better applications. So here is all that comes together. So uh, again, you know, I talked about bits, neurons, and qubit. All three forms of computing is coming together. And that is the amazing part of where we are in this industry or in this technology generation where, uh, you know, between uh, mathematics plus information, learning from biological system, and learning from physics system. And then the way we consume all of this is going to be through cloud, using hybrid cloud technology. So depending on your need, you can use AI system, or quantum system, or classical system. Uh, and that's the power of uh, uh, where, where we are heading. So at the end, uh, it's a power of V. Uh, let's uh, create the future of computing together between IBM and Rensselaer. Uh, thank you very much. I know we're running slightly late, but there's time for at least one question. Is there a question? Yes. yes. You had spoken on the energy consumption for traditional bits and for neurons. Um, I understand that qubits have this massive energy efficiency <laughs> performance increase, but there's also a lot of energy that has to be used for the cooling. Could you talk a little bit on how like, the overall energy use for quantum computers compares <coughs> to traditional computers, keeping in mind that cooling aspect? Yeah, no, uh, that's a great question. We are, uh, we, are, we are at the early stage of that assessment. Clearly, energy required to cool these bigger and bigger quantum computers is just enormous. In fact, some of the fridge that you will come and see in Yorktown Heights are bigger than, almost as big as this room, actually. Uh, and we have to cool that to you know, very, very low temperature. So we are very cognizant of, uh, of energy required for cooling technology. And uh, you know, I, don't, I don't have exact number, like how do I compare? Because I need to have the application in my hand to be able to show, OK, if this application is run on a classical computer, it will take this much energy as compared to run on a quantum computer, how much? So that's a, that's a great question, and we need to answer that as quantum computing technology improves and becomes more commercially viable. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one more speaker, and I'm very excited to hear his talk. We just heard a wonderful talk uh, on uh, the problems of energy needed for calculations, and we are going to hear more about uh, energy from the next speaker. 
Uh, Professor Robert C. Armstrong is director of the MIT in Energy Initiative. He's the Chevron Professor of Chemical Engineering. He directs the MIT Energy Initiative, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, it's an institute-wide effort at MIT linking science, technology, and policy to transform the world's energy systems. He's a member of the MIT faculty since 1973. Uh, Bob uh, served as the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering from 96 to 2007. Uh, he was appointed director of the MIT Energy Initiative in 2013 after serving as the organization's deputy director from 2007 to 13. And he's now the founding director, uh, excuse me, with the founding director, Ernest Moniz. All of you know who he was in the government. Um, his research is focused on pathway to a low carbon energy future. Uh, Bob has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences 2020 and the National Academy of Engineering 2008. He received the 2006 Bingham Medal for the Society, from the Society of Rheology. And um, that's a ve very big and important medal because uh, it's a focused group talking about uh, rheology. And uh, we have somebody in chemical engineering here that is a member of that society, uh, Patrick Underhill. Um, uh, he's uh, devoted, uh, let's see, which is devoted to the study of science and deformation uh, of flow matter, and he's uh, won the Founders Award, the, War the Warren K. Lewis Award, and the Professional Progress Award, all from the Institute of Chemical Engineering. These are major awards for our field, and I just want to emphasize that. Professor Armstrong chaired the MIT recent Future of Energy Storage Study, was a member of MIT's Future of Natural Gas and Future of Solar Energy Studies groups. He advised teams that developed uh, the MIT Energy Initiative recent reports, the future nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world, and insights into the future mobility. He co-edited Game Changers, Energy on the Move with former US Secretary of State, George Shultz. Just one personal note, I have been on sabbatical to uh, six different universities and three times to MIT and the first time was uh, with Bob as head of department and he's the only head of department in any one of those six sabbatical leaves that invited me to have lunch with him and talk to him about my future and what I wanted to do. Uh, he's a real gentleman and a very fine person, and I know a superb scientist and engineer, and I look forward to having him give us the next talk. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, George. Um, I guess you've been to MIT three times, so we're still trying to get it right. Is that... <laughs> and anyway, th thank you very much for having me here. This is, is a great pleasure to, to be at this particular event uh, because I've, I've known Marty uh, since he came to MIT, basically. And uh, what I'll try to reflect on in this talk is what we, what we do at MITEI, um, what we've found, some of the results, and, and what that means for you in terms of how lucky you are to have Marty Smith as your new president. So let me, let me start. Uh, um, George helped me out uh, by giving you the, the sort of the mission statement for MITEI. Uh, M-I-T-E-I, we pronounce MITEI. Uh, Ernie and I worked very hard on the acronym so we could say, <laughs> say something like MITEI. Um, so we, we look to bridge disciplines together. Um, that's, I think, an important theme that will go through here, is that to make headway on a, on a set of challenges like energy, um, you need to have all the disciplines you can get. I obviously haven't listed all possible disciplines, but that's what, that's what that points to. Um, 
we're, we're after transforming the world's energy system. And what does that mean, right? So we need a different energy system globally, or I should say systems. It will, systems will look quite different in different parts of the world. But, but there's three big drivers that I'll put here for what we're trying to achieve here. Number one, and I think probably foremost on many of your minds, is how do we mitigate climate change? So how can we mitigate and, and avoid the worst impacts of climate change? Second is, and I think also extraordinarily important, is how do we get energy to people who have no energy access or are grossly underserved by energy? And, and that is a large part of the world's population. Um, energy use uh, per capita is very closely correlated with GDP per capita, right? So there's a strong correlation between your access to energy and your standard of, of living. And, and so that's a, that's a key issue. The third issue is one that we, we started with as, as a um, sort of a foundational challenge at for MITEI. Uh, it's something George and I were emphasizing in the book, Game Changers, and, and that's energy security. And we've been sort of rolling along smoothly globally for a while now, uh, until um, this past uh, February when Russia invaded the Ukraine. And, and that's brought to the fore, amidst all of the tragedy, the, the security issues we have in our energy supply chains uh, globally. And, and so we need, as we develop these new energy systems, to have not just reliability, but resilience to disruptions like that. And, and that means ultimately diversity of supply. Um, the, the MIT Energy Initiative uh, started in 2006. Um, this was the brainchild of, of our president who was getting inaugurated then. Um, so we'll see what happens at, at Rensselaer now with Marty's inauguration. Um, Susan Hockfield uh, had as two major thrusts. Uh, one was integrating or bringing together life sciences and, and engineering. Um, that surprised nobody at MIT because she's a neuroscientist and, and we'd been doing that sort of work for 30 years uh, before. But, but her other thrust was energy, and that did surprise a lot of people. Uh, but she said that one of the reasons for that was that she talked a lot of faculty around campus before her inauguration, and she said by far the most common answer she got to the question, what should MIT focus on, was energy. And, and she listened. Um, I think you'll find Marty is a wonderful listener. Um, and, and I think interesting things have come from this, uh, very productive. Um, we were charged with being a cross-campus initiative, so reaching across campus. Um, we, we have now engaged about 350, 400 faculty across MIT's 1,000, uh, 1,100 faculty. Um, so we have engaged, I think, a broad group of faculty, every department on campus uh, in one way uh, or another has been involved in, in the ener energy initiative. Lots of different ways to contribute. Um, we have uh, four major thrusts, the research. So many of these faculty are involved in the research programs. Some focused on education, along with faculty doing research. Um, some of the faculty doing outreach, this future of studies that, uh, that George mentioned in the introduction is part of that outreach. Um, so how do we inform uh, public policy makers, for example? And then campus energy management, how, how might we use MIT's campus as a living laboratory to try out some ideas? Uh, with, with the idea in the back of our minds that we're looking for technologies that if we could test them out and prove them on campus, they could scale up. That one's grayed out there, um, and, and, and that I mean to, to gray out as a success story. So un under Marty's leadership, that actually has spun out as sort of an institutional element now at MIT. So within the physical plant, there's an office of sustainability, and they very consciously manage our physical plant and look to, to its growth in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, energy being a big part of that. So I think that's, a, that's a, a nice thing when you can see, you know, what, what started out as a task force within an initiative to be a, an institutional um, element. 
Just, just some numbers uh, about what we've done at MITEI. We have large research program. That's how we get faculty in, involved. Uh, almost a thousand research projects we've funded across uh, campus. A lot of those are, are small seed projects, and I'll say a little bit more about what happens to those seed projects. But the seed projects are really important to get new faculty involved in energy. So faculty who are new to MIT, so uh, new assistant professors, or faculty have transferred, or faculty who are experts in, say, material science, but have never brought those talents to bear on energy. So how do you get them to think about um, energy? Um, and, and then large multi-faculty, multidisciplinary projects, uh, say a large solar center that we've run uh, for years. Um, we've worked to help departments bring in new students uh, in energy. When we launched, um, energy was not a major theme uh, at, at MIT. This was 2007, uh, late 2006. Um, and so we, we gave out fellowships, graduate fellowships to departments to, to help bring in new students interested in working uh, in energy. Um, we've now, in our education program, in addition to a minor that we offer to every undergraduate um, at MIT, um, we have now gone online as a way to reach much broader groups of students around the world because we need not just researchers, but we need to develop a cadre, a large cadre of experts globally who can actually design, build, and operate these energy systems uh, of the future. One interesting piece uh, uh, at, at MITEI and at MIT more generally is, is the startup environment there. Um, we have spun out some 100 plus startups at MIT in the energy area since MITEI launched. And I, and I think the ecosystem that we've created um, is, is a big piece of, of that. And I'll show you two examples of those startups, um, pretty interesting startups, a, a little later on. Uh, George mentioned the, the future of energy storage study we just finished. Um, we have started uh, years ago a set of studies looking at what are some key technologies that could play an order one role in a transformed energy system um, and what needs to happen at, at a policy level to enable those technologies to contribute. Nuclear was the first one we did, um, and we've done nuclear over several times, uh, so maybe it's a hard one to get right. Um, we, we, we've done the future of coal, that is clean coal, um, probably now the view on clean coal, it's coal that's left in the ground. Um, but that was coal with CCS, and we learned a lot about CCS then, which, which was useful. Uh, geothermal, uh, the electric grid, natural gas, solar, um, and so on. And, and we're just starting a study on fusion. Um, so it's gonna be a, a really hard one, I think. Um, but those have been very useful in, in informing public policy makers. I, I was struck in, in Margaret's talk about her comment about students doing art, uh, looking at art problems, they don't really have an answer, right? So there's not, not the answer you're trying to, to discover. Um, I, I think these policy studies are much like that. Uh, policy doesn't have an answer. And, and it's not just one person trying to understand what they think is the right solution. It's, it's us collectively trying to understand how we could work together collectively to get to um, energy solutions and climate solutions uh, that regionally satisfy us and the problem um, and, and globally. And so I, I think that's an extraordinarily um, interesting problem. Uh, so I, I think we've done well uh, so far. This is a sign I keep on my wall to remind me that um, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. So you have to keep thinking about where to go, where to go next. Um, one of the places we're going next is what we call a future energy system center. Um, we have spent a lot of our work in the early years of MITEI working with faculty in, in understanding technologies better, right? So understanding novel ways to make solar, for example, cheaper. Uh, novel ways to make uh, energy storage devices, uh, ways to improve fission, 
uh, technology. But ultimately, it's how you fit all those pieces together into a system that delivers the energy services that consumers want that matters, right? So we are now refocusing with this Future Energy System Center to, to understand how to bring all those different elements together. So we understand not just how we produce energy in the future, whether it's solar or wind or fusion, um, but, and how we use it, but, but how those intersect with, with one another. So we, in this center, we have at, at the center this set of uh, little bubbles around here, um, focused on key segments of, of the energy sector. So the electricity sector, transportation, um, industry, and buildings. I'll point out that for those jet flights, uh, Mukesh, that you pointed out, uh, we're trying to get rid of the carbon emissions there. So, so the, the, the comparison is going to get harder and harder <laughs> as we go forward. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at those parts of the energy sector, plus some cross-cutting themes like low-carbon fuels, um, energy storage technologies, carbon management that, that we can do there. And then we couple those with uh, groups at MIT that focus on macroeconomics and climate science so that we can understand quantitatively climate policy implications on climate change and the economy um, at large globally or, or regionally. And then the, on the right side, uh, we link to uh, a group called the, the uh, uh, Center for Environmental and Policy Research. Um, it's led by a, a professor, Chris Knittle, in the Sloan School of Business School, he's an economist, that Mighty brought to MIT as a new faculty member, uh, as a commitment made by the administration, if we raise the funds for a limited number of new professors, we could bring in new faculty. Uh, again, Marty, to the rescue, he has showed up and, and helped uh, with some of those processes to bring in new people to help leverage the existing strength um, that we have on, on campus. Uh, so, so this joint program allows, um, excuse me, the, the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research lets us look at policy impacts through um, experimental uh, randomized control trials, a way to look at human behavior, uh, some of the things that I think Ken pointed to as, as well in his talk, to understand how policies actually will play out um, in, in practice. So that's our, that's our playground uh, for this Future Energy uh, System Center. Uh, we, we are, next week we have our first annual meeting from the center, but we're now about 35 members in this center. And with this new broader construct, we have then members going from mining companies at the upstream end to end use companies like uh, Toyota, for example. Um, I, I wanna finish with some examples looking at research results that have come out of, of Mighty. I think some of these are, are pretty interesting. I mentioned uh, uh, early in the talk that we do a lot of seed projects. Um, we've done maybe $27 million worth of seed projects over the 15 years, letting faculty try out new ideas. See, these are small projects, it's 150K to try out an idea, get a graduate student for a year or postdoc for uh, about a year uh, to try out a new idea. Um, and, and, and those have gone lots of different directions. Um, this is one uh, of those early seed projects um, looking at novel geothermal uh, technology. Um, wh one of the things that, that you discover as you look at how to build out future energy systems is that solar and wind, which are gonna certainly be key uh, to future energy systems, aren't gonna get you all the way there. It, it's gonna be really, really important to have firm carbon-free generation capacity in the system. Geothermal is an example of something that, that might do that. Um, one of the challenges with, with geothermal is that the rock you can access uh, to extract heat uh, that's reasonably close to the surface, a couple of miles, um, say, is often not very hot. And so the, the power cycles, thermal power cycles you use to, use to make electricity out of that aren't very efficient. So what Quay's Energy, um, one of these 
early seed projects um, does is to think differently about how you drill so that you can drill much deeper. And their idea was to use a millimeter wave energy source um, to vaporize rock instead of mechanically grinding it up. Um, and so you get a uniform size bore deep as you want to go as you lower the, the beam down into the, into the substructure. Thereafter, they're pretty ambitious. They're after about um, uh, 12 miles um, to go after 900 degrees centigrade uh, uh, thermal sources, which would give you a very efficient uh, power cycle um, up above ground. So that's, that's uh, very, uh, very encouraging, I think. That, that one's uh, just uh, out in the Boston Globe earlier this spring. Um, this is another one of the research projects, not a, not a seed project, but this is an example of what we've done with multi-faculty uh, projects. We had a team of about 18 to 20 faculty working in the solar area, trying to develop novel solar manufacturing processes so that you could make solar much cheaper uh, with much less capital investment in the material, for, in, in the processing equipment, say, roll to roll uh, processing equipment, um, which gives you lightweight, flexible PV. Um, I mentioned the roll-to-roll -roll printing. New materials like perovskites, which allow you to put together multi-junction uh, solar cells much more efficient and, and much more cheaply. Um, this is an example of one of the results out of that uh, Solar Frontiers Center. Uh, it's transparent PV. Um, which uh, demonstrated by Vladimir Bulovic, the professor on the left, uh, and, and uh, Miles Barr, a Kim e graduate student. That's now uh, spun out as a startup called Ubiquitous. Um, uh, the original target uh, is cell phones, uh, e-readers, things like that. So you have a high value added market. You can get back the cost of, of uh, this technology. So that, that's a an interesting change on the solar side and, and, and may, I think, actually have an impact in terms of where we can manufacture solar if we can move to these roll-to-roll uh, -roll technologies and alleviate some of the choke points we're having today with supply chains. Um, the last technology I'll, I'll mention is fusion. And, and, and I mention this because um, f fusion is another one of those technologies that could be zero emissions, but dispatchable uh, going forward. It, it is, I know the joke well, it's the energy of the future always has been and always will be. But, but, but something profound has happened in fusion in the last five, six years. And, and that's that a number of startup groups around the world, that's on, on the order of 40, have, have looked at the fundamental science that government has supported around the world over the last six, seven decades. Oops, did I do that? Oops. The last six or seven, seven decades um, and looked at what could you do to step out of that big science model uh, to accelerate the deployment of fusion uh, commercially on much shorter time scales. This is an, an example that spun out of MIT um, and, and another reason for showing this that uh, again, Marty turned out to be a big player in this uh, because you need people who understand the startup uh, culture, uh, the innovation system, and, and are willing to think out of, of the box um, as we go forward. Um, so Commonwealth Fusion Systems spun out of MIT. Uh, it is now a member uh, of the MIT Energy Initiative. Um, some of the interesting new features of them as a startup company are, number one, the, the large amount of capital, capital you need in order to fund a, a fusion startup. Uh, this is not something you can do with three people in a garage. Um, they, they needed for their first round of funding about 150 million in order to build uh, some very high power, um, high temperature superconducting magnets. And, and I show here on the right the, the magnet, the, the first test magnet they built. This is a full-scale magnet for their reactor. Um, it is, uh, it set a world's record for this kind of magnet 
back in September a year ago, um, sadly at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Um, but but it, it hit uh, 20 Tesla, a little over 20 Tesla, um, using uh, Repco high temperature superconductors. The power in to keep this thing at 20 uh, Tesla is 40 watts. Wow. So it's, a, it, it, it's an amazingly efficient system once you get it uh, powered up. Um, they are now, they've now raised the funding. This was their first stage gate as a startup company. So they've raised money now to, to build 19 of these, same size, put them in a ring to confine a tokamak. Um, they, they need these magnets because the, the, the plasma runs at 300 million degrees centigrade. So it's hard to hold otherwise. Um, they, they've built the, the manufacturing facility for these now. They've poured concrete for actually building uh, their reactor um, just west of, of Boston. Um, and, and we're looking forward to a really interesting uh, test within a couple of years. That, that, by the way, that second round of funding was $1.8 wow. which starts not to sound like a startup co company <laughs> in, anymore. But, but this is what it will take to do a technology like this, a large-scale technology, fast. Um, so it took them much more, uh, much, much more capital uh, than a typical startup. It's taken them a lot more human capital. So they partnered with MIT on this because they needed access to 100 professionals, experts in, in plasma fusion science, who built tokamaks in the past. Um, and, and they needed patient capital uh, and special, specialized facilities. So that's, that's promising, but I think it's an indication of things to come uh, in ener energy innovation. So I, I'm, I'm going to close by just making some observations about where I think academia needs to play in, in the energy transition. Um, we obviously have a, a role to play in early stage research. It, it's discovery that's at the core of, of what academia does. It's, it's in our nature to look cross-sectoral, uh, to look across disciplines and across parts of, of the economy, um, to look at emerging market developing economy countries, how do we help get them the access they need to energy startups, how do we scale this up, innovative ways to scale up uh, startups. Education clearly falls in, in our domain. Um, I think we've heard some interesting ideas about education here this morning from from Ken, um, I think we need to think hard about those problems, how we inform policymakers, um, and do that in a, in a role of honest brokers, not telling them what to do, but helping them make uh, wiser decisions. Um, so that leads to the outreach, what, which I've mentioned, and then engagement with industry and government. I think that's natural for, for academia to link, and we've heard Great story with IBM uh, here today. Uh, we've seen uh, Matt talking about the work in, in biotechnology with, excuse me, Dave. I, you or your brother, Juan, right? <laughs> yeah, not, not exactly. Um, and, and I think all of that uh, is a key part for, uh, for academia to play. So all, all those ingredients you can find <laughs> in, in a person, it turns out, um, you, you, you need the kind of vision we had at Mighty when we launched from our president, then Susan Hockfield. Um, we, we need active outreach to the faculty, staff, students across the institute. When I was department head, I was just awed by Marty's work running the Microsystems Technology Laboratory, taking the capabilities they had and bridging out to essentially all disciplines at MIT to bring that capability. And it was just amazing to see microchemical reactors, microturbines, microchemical assays, all sorts of new things you could do. But it's from bridging across, across disciplines. Um, engaging the grassroots uh, like that and the commitment to working across sectors. And, and Marty has certainly exemplified that. So that's Marty as director of MTO. I, that's Marty in the bottom left. I'm not sure when exactly. <laughs> Could be when he was a brand new assistant professor. But congratulations, uh, great choice.
can't see. There's one there. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this amazing overview and all of the insights. Um, I have a question which is regarding to enhanced uh, geothermal systems. Yeah. How sustainable are they? And how uh, fragile are they regarding earthquakes? So it's like an uh, underground pipeline that you pump cold water in, uh, cold substances, and get hot one out. Well, if there's a leak that you can't obviously control for when an earthquake happens, then there might be that the fluid is flowing into a different direction. And, um, are there any projections or estimates of uh, how susceptible they are to uh, earthquakes? Yeah, so, so step one would be uh, very careful and accurate characterization of the ground where you want to put a geothermal uh, facility. So understanding uh, what fractures or, or micro cracks are there in, in that substrata. Um, then monitoring. Um, as, you, as you drill, whether vaporizing the rock or however you do it, um, and producing uh, thermal energy fr from the, the uh, resource. So I think, uh, I think the modern cap monitoring capabilities are there. Um, and, and those are somewhat related capabilities to what we will need to do large-scale carbon management for sequestering CO2 from direct air capture or however you get it. But th those are going to be, I, I think, key, key pieces of the energy system going forward. Okay. I just have one uh, small comment and question. Um, I was involved in fusion energy at my company for quite a number of years. And uh, back in the 80s, the United States of America lost the fusion lead. Now the work is being done around the world, obviously with ITER and JET and what have you. Your comment about MIT getting involved in government policy is so critical now for the United States to retain the lead. So all I would encourage you uh, to do that, and maybe RPI can even get involved too, that's not my position, but it is so critical that leadership take place here, all right, because there's so much wonderful work as you've demonstrated by mm -hmm the work at MIT on magnets, which are so critical. But the ITER being done in France today should have been done in the United States under the Fed program almost 30 years ago. And unfortunately, we lost the lead. So I just hope I encourage you to continue that push in that, in that direction, where MIT can help our government uh, people decide on a good policy. I don't know if it makes you help any feel any better about having lost Either, but um, the fact that it's in France, uh, it's, it's a big science project. It's yes, been it extraordinarily informative, right, yes, and really important. But I think the commercial success in fusion is not going to come from Eater. It will right. come from one of these, right. maybe more, uh, of, of these startups out there. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, I'd like yeah. to thank Bob. Yes, a big thank you to all those in attendance, and let's uh, give another round of applause to all of the speakers. Thank you again. So this marked the uh, beginning of the uh, celebration of the inauguration activities for the day. I invite you to uh, head out to the 86th field. There are 18 food trucks. Help yourself to some lunch, and then we'll reconvene for the um, uh, for the actual investiture ceremony a little bit later. At 1.30 is when we start.